30 in Auditorium 3. The speaker will be Mr. Jim McKelvey. Topic, Fostering Innovation. Thank you. So in five minutes, we're starting. Interestingly, www.qpay.com.qa was reserved by me back in 2005 because I knew there's a play for this business, but I didn't see it yet. And I pulled the trigger on this in uh, about 2011, 2012, and we've been live for about three months now because there's a lot of preparation that we had to uh, get going. So there's a lot going on in this in this business. Let me explain to you what is what is QPay, what is the concept that we do, okay? So when you walk to a, uh, a store and you pay with a credit card, a lot of people think that you're, the money is going from your card to the merchant. Uh, but in reality, what's happening is money is being moved from your bank account, the consumer bank account, to the merchant's bank account. And the instructions come from your card and that point of sale, which tells where that money needs to, uh, needs to land. The same thing when you buy with, a, with a, an e-commerce online, the same thing, you're sending instructions through the payment gateway to send money from your bank account to the merchant's bank account, of course, after the shipment of the products. Uh, if you travel overseas and you pull money from an ATM, you've got the cash, but what's happening at the end of day, there's all this communication between these banks to ask for the money that you pulled from that bank, let's say in New York, to be shipped all the way back to your bank in, uh, in Doha. So to make all this thing happen, there's a lot of security, infrastructure, communication, uh, and a lot of payment infrastructure or electronic payment infrastructure in place that needs to be established. Now, big banks have you know, a huge staff, they have all this infrastructure, they have the security, they have the data centers, the technology, the experience, everything to build this, this type of stuff. But smaller banks don't have it, or mid-sized banks, and I'll tell you a little bit uh, uh, more about this as, as we uh, discuss this. So a lot of the smaller banks and the mid-sized banks outsource this to a uh, third-party payment processor. Now, to do this thing for as an outsourced operation for a bank, you have to comply with a lot of uh, laws, regulations, uh, central banks, and a lot is involved in this and in, in, uh, being able to outsource this. So QPay is technically the infrastructure behind a lot of the payment processing that I was just describing earlier. Uh, and then what we do it, we do it for mid-sized banks, not the necessarily the large banks, the banks who don't have the infrastructure, the capability, the experience, and they can outsource it to us in a secure way and we can manage it for them. But to the front end, you're thinking you're, you're, you're buying uh, that product from the, from, the, uh, from the bank. Now this concept has, uh, is already proven to work, of course, in the Western countries as well as in the, uh, in the GCC. So if you uh, ever travel to Dubai and you're checking out of your hotel or you're buying something at a restaurant, you get that printout, it'll say Network International. That's exactly what we do. They're actually an outsourced payment processor that a lot of the banks would use. In Bahrain, a company called Air Financial Services. In Kuwait, uh, for some of you who have been in Kuwait, it's called Knet. And in Qatar, it's, uh, it's QPay. We offer multiple products, and our products, we would offer them to banks and financial institutions and exchange houses as well. And we have two types of products. So products we call issuing. Issuing, which is products that give you money. So something like, <clears throat> 
if you are a low wage employee and instead of getting paid via cash, you get paid on a, on a card. You take your card, go to an ATM machine, you get your cash, you can spend, you can do whatever you want. Instead of getting cash, now you get an electronic card with a bank account behind it. Uh, gift cards, you know, happy birthday, instead of pulling 500, you know, real cash and give you a uh, happy birthday uh, cash, I can just uh, go buy a gift card. would have a Visa MasterCard on it. I give 500 uh, reals at the point of sale. I get the card, I give you the card in a nice envelope, happy birthday. Now you take that card and you can spend it at multiple uh, locations. Travel cards, people who want to go to the Hajj, instead of you know walking around with a bunch of cash, they can also have a card. And these are issuing, these are products that give you money in your hand. There's also acquiring products. Acquiring are uh, products that will enable an SME, a small, uh, small mid-sized enterprise, to receive money electronically from you. So these, uh, these are point of sale. Uh, type of solutions. There's also a mobile point of sale type of product. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Or e-commerce. You know, you start a new business. You want to, you know, you want to sell some type of product or electronic, and you want to receive payments online in a secure way. Then we also have those. Um, so we have data centers in Qatar. We have our infrastructure here, and we are uh, Qatar Central Bank. Uh, licensed, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, about that in detail. We have a full uh, family of products that we uh, we offer from the the different cards as well as the the accepting of the payments. We follow all the Qatar Central Bank uh, KYC, which is know your client, AML anti money laundering, ATF anti terrorist funding, uh, catch, which is Qatar um, catch, Qatar automated clearing house. Uh, IBAN, uh, PCI, payment uh, uh, card uh, industry, for the security, and then all our solutions are offered securely with a chip so that when you use your card, you can't have skimming machines or they can copy your card and suddenly you cannot, uh, you know, they, can, they can go and transact behind your back. It has to have an actual chip on it. We have a very strong management team uh, and uh, local ownership of the business. Uh, as well as, you know, as a founder, I come from this industry. I have 20 plus years of experience, barely 20, because I'm still a young guy, but I do have 11 registered patents. Now, a lot of people could fake that and say, hey, I had dinner with Brooke Shields, but if, when you say I have 11 uh, registered patents, you can actually Google them and look me up to see that. We won last year's best uh, technology company at uh, Al Fikra and the uh, Arab uh, Forum. And uh, what I want to do now that, that I give you a general idea, I want to get into specific details of some of the products that we offer uh, in Qatar and kind of share with you our success story as well. So Qatar, if you actually look at Qatar, um, it has about, I would say, 20% locals, Qataris, citizens, about 10% what we call expats, guys like us who are banked. Uh, and then about 1.3 million, and a lot of these are actually growing, uh, of, uh, of uh, immigrant, low-wage immigrant workers. So actually right now, these are statistics from 2011. Right now we're looking about maybe about 1.6 million of low-wage employees who get paid less than 3,000 Qatar Riyals. These low-wage employees on payday, they line up, and the company will bring all the cash, you know, uh, from from the bank, and they set up the cash on tables. Every employee comes in. They put their the thumb print that they got paid, and then immediately after they get paid, now it's a huge nightmare for the back office to manage who got paid, who didn't get paid, etc. And these employees, after after they're getting paid, first thing they do is they go to the exchange house so they can send money home, and they go buy a calling card, and then they leave a little bit of money to spend uh, for themselves. Interestingly, these employees don't have bank accounts. So now when they have cash, they li a lot of them live in uh, these um, uh, labor camps. So they live together, they got their cash, they put it in their pocket, they're sleeping, somebody comes in, steals their cash. There's a lot of issues, there's a lot of crime, a lot of problems happening in the labor camps. Uh, interestingly, late, I'd say uh, this has actually happened late uh, last year. There was a, a, a long documentary of this life of these low-wage employees in these labor camps. And uh, following to that, Amnesty International has actually issued a, uh, a violation for Qatar for the uh, low-wage employee labor camp uh, abuse of uh, their human rights. Now, right after that happened, the Qatar Central Bank in uh, February issued a new regulation that all employees need to be paid electronically, either on a bank account 
or on a card. What that means is I cannot say, hey, I, I got you paid. And when you say, show me proof, so I paid you yesterday at the Starbucks. Where's your proof? Now, the Qatar Central Bank wants to see every transaction electronically tracked for that employee, okay? Now, the banks, they don't want these uh, low-level employees because now suddenly, if you have four or five branches or 10 branches in Doha, and you have all this million and a half employees come into your location, suddenly your locations are being saturated, and actually what they're going after is the, the high net worth and maybe some expats. These employees are growing, so we actually did a lot of demographics on how many of these employees buy uh, by uh, country. And they're expected to grow more as Qatar is getting ready for the World Cup 2022. So what's happening? Banks are freaking out right now. They're saying, what should we do? You know, we are in a really bad situation now. We have to build all this infrastructure, all these uh, ability to be able to electronically bank these low-wage employees, and we just don't have the systems that are going to cost us a lot of money. Ta-da! Here comes QPay. Our solution is a, a, a branded for, a, it's called a private label solution. So these banks could actually use our solution fully outsourced and be able to service uh, this low wage uh, market uh, uh, segment. Our solution actually is a six in one type of product that service the employer as well as the SME or the businesses. Let me get into a little bit more detail. Part of the solution, the bank gives the employer full ability to track every employee, okay? Their uh, information, their contact detail, their first name, their last name, they upload their KYC, their, you know, the, the detailed Department of Labor information that is required, like uh, this, their uh, the Qatar uh, ID, their passport, their visa, their, their uh, entry visa, their exit visa, their whole, all that information. And it also includes ability to track that employee's hours. Because when you say, I'm paying you a thousand reals, what are you paying me for? So the Department of Labor will come back and say, why are you paying that employee 1,100 reals or 1,000 or 900? Well, now you have ability to track the, that employee worked eight hours standard time, 10 hours overtime, you know, he was on sick leave, he was on vacation, you can track exactly their, their, their payment to the detail. And we track that and we, we keep it on the cloud for 15 years for free for that employer. But it's private labeled to the, uh, to, the, to the bank, of course. And it will track the employees across multiple locations. So it will tell you, okay, here's a construction site, a uh, construction company that has multiple locations where it does uh, temporary work. It will track how many hours you've worked, total hours, worked hours, paid hours. And then it gives you a actual uh, report that, that says how many of those employees got paid. This is the, the report that the Department, uh, the Qatar Central Bank of the D Department of Labor want. And it comes for free with our solution. Plus, as an employer now, you can order cards, you can cancel cards, you have full self-service management of your, of your employees, so you can track their hours, track their KYC, and pay them uh, at the same time, and you have full ability, and this whole solution is private label to the local banks. So I don't know if some of you have seen the, uh, the square, where you can take a, uh, your mobile phone and put a, a little widget on it, and then now your mobile phone will act as a uh, payment device. Uh, we have a square solution, but in Qatar, you cannot, the squares only take some magnetic stripe. In Qatar, you have to have a chip reader. So our device will actually take chip, and then we also uh, do private labeling on the mobile app for you to accept uh, money, pay with your card, send money home, pay bills, and do all kinds of different things. And we private label that to the financial institutions. You can also take signature if you want. We also have point of sale solutions. So uh, a lot of people say, wait a second. Um, you know, I see these in, in Qatar. True. You know, you only have three banks in Qatar that offer point of sale devices, which is QNB, Commercial Bank, and Doha Bank. But how about the rest of the, the other 15 banks in Qatar? Okay, who is enable them, enabling them for point of sale e uh, e commerce solutions? We have the infrastructure, and we already are actually talking right now to banks to offer this product. So we offer a full slew of e-commerce on the point of sale, e-commerce uh, solutions were on the website where you can come in and pay from a secure gateway website or on the device and we have the full infrastructure to collect the money, settle it with your local bank or with our bank and then turn around and pay out that merchant either direct on a debit card or uh, into, into, their, uh, into their, uh, their bank account. So 
you, you technically come in, you sign up for an e-commerce solution with us, which is private label to a bank name, and your consumers, your shoppers will come in, buy from you, we collect that money, we settle it, and then we say, Where, how would you like that money? Would you like it in a check? Would you like it in a card? So you can now you take that card, go to an ATM machine, get your cash. Or would you like us to do a direct deposit into your account? It's up to you how you want to do that. And we, all, we have the whole infrastructure. We also have an easy uh, build your own website, something very similar to our Shopify type of solution. You come in, you get a new merchant account, you click new, you follow certain specific information because we have to comply with the Qatar Central Bank. For example, you have to have a CR. Uh, we cannot give you ability to pay online without a CR because you could be selling drugs or whatever it is. We cannot take the liability for that. Um, or you can log into your account. You can you know, go in quickly, click, click, upload pictures, build a store if you want. So we have a, you know, a client that has a, a gym type of business. And then immediately now consumers could come to your website and pay with their credit card and it's fully 100% fully secure. So we'll have your name on it, it's up and running in no time. Uh, build your store and you're up and, and, uh, and you can collect transactions in a secure way. You can manage all your transactions from the different uh, e-commerce POS or mobile POS. You know, you have the, uh, dashboards and all kinds of different you know, transaction reports that we offer with our solution. Interestingly, now one of the things we do is as you build your store, okay, through our partner banks here in Qatar, we automatically have an online mall for you. So think of it this way. Here's this first person building his shoe store. Another SME is building their, let's say, electronic store, and there's another one building a, a, a shirt store. As you're building your store in the beginning, in your settings, you will say, would you like to be part of the e-mall? So let's say for whichever bank that we're working with, they'll say, okay, we're gonna offer you an e-mall. Now, if somebody comes to your store on their shopping cart, they can only buy shoes and then check out or buy electronics and check out, because that's all you get in that, in that uh, shopping cart. But at the same time, if you choose to be part of the e-mall, somebody could come to the e-mall and in one shopping cart, they can buy shoes, electronics, clothes, whatever they want. And that's also part of our infrastructure that we offer. So what's our revenue model? It's pretty straightforward. I mean, you know, when you play with money, you can make money. Uh, it's kind of funny, like we say, well, how do you make money? Well, when you're playing with money and doing all these transactions, you can always get a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, so we can make money by uh, uh, based on percent of, tr uh, of transaction or fixed fee per transaction when we do setups of our uh, you know solutions per bank per product uh, per uh, you know hardware fees if we are offering POS or uh, point of, or uh, mobile POSs and then of course there's a monthly fees per SME and then you know certain minimum per month as we operate our business. Uh, where we're at right now, we have contracts signed with Qatar National Bank, UBL, Ahli Bank. And then as you can see, this is the line, this is the target, and we're trying to get a lot of these and kind of push them to that, to that side until we're, we're done with them. Um, we're also interested in finding uh, very interesting opportunities with exchange houses as well. But this is something uh, that we will do in our next uh, uh, iteration of our business model. So at the end, you know, what we're looking for, we're looking for partnerships primarily. We're looking for banks and financial institutions that can come work with us uh, and potential investors who understand our ecosystem. We're not, so we, in, in the US we call that uh, smart money. So we were looking for investors who can help uh, add value to our business. And then our objective, of course, is to IPO this business in about 24 to 36. We believe that there's a window for IPO, especially in uh, Qatar. The stock market right now is going high, and I think uh, tech firms uh, are expected to, uh, to do very well. That's pretty much it. Any questions for Nabil on that? Actually, please. I have one question. You have to ask a question, please. Yes, in the back. Are we the only company in Qatar who does this? The answer is yes. Because uh, to build this type of business, uh, it's, this is not a matter of millions, this is a matter of tens of millions. Because you have to have infrastructure in place, you have to have uh, regulation, you have to uh, be, you know, work with the central banks. You have to have the full infrastructure to work with a Visa, MasterCard, GCB, Union Pay, and be trusted by them to do all this transaction. Because at the end of the day, when I was showing you, like I said, when we're collecting payroll, let's say you have a company that has 10,000 employees at 1,000, uh, reals per employee on average, or actually 1,500, 
you're collecting almost 100 million to 150 million BLs per month for payroll. So, uh, you, you know, for, for you to have that type of ability, that type of responsibility, there's so much you have to do in the back to be able to, uh, to do this thing. So, yes. I cannot hear you, I'm so sorry. What is the transaction fees? What are the transaction fees? Yeah. So, um, and if, if, if you take a, if, if you're a merchant you're accepting a point of sale, you have to pay fees because that's the, how the industry works. It's like you saying, you know, I would like to drive a car on a, on a, on a let's say, a toll fee without paying. So, the industry is based on uh, merchant pay and it's called an interchange fee. That's how it is. So, we are part of that, of that industry. So it depends on your volume. So let's say if you're Carrefour, you pay, let's say, between 1.5 to maybe 1.9%, okay? Depending on the card. So if you have a card, some cards will have 1.1. If it's a, like a special, like high-end card, uh, then it will be, let's say, 1.9. But this is Carrefour, these are big guys. But if you're an SME, expect to pay out, say, between 2.5 to 3, 2.7, depending on which, what you're doing, on the percentage. There's some, maybe some fees for some setup, et cetera, but doesn't, it's not that much. But the whole industry runs on that interchange. Does that answer your question? Thank you, yes. One more. So let me, let me go. The way we, 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 we've decided to go to market with, through our bank partners. So when you come to us and we say, who's your bank? So let's say if you say QNB, we say, okay, here's a product for you to use. Let's say if you say it's, for example, QIB or a different bank, then we, we would take you to this model. Oh, then we take you to the model and we say, okay, we will collect that money. We'll have to hold it by law in, let's say, QNB, but then we will forward that money to your account. So you really don't have to have a solution or you don't have to bank with our banks in order for you to have the solution. But you have to understand that that money will take one stop, let's say at a QNB or whoever it is that we're working with, and then it will, it will land in your account. Because by law, I cannot take your money that you collect on point of sale or e-commerce and put it in a bills account. That's by law, I cannot do that. So I have to put it in a financial institution that is certified by the Qatar Central Bank which is, let's say, QNB, whomever, and then I have to ship it in your account. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, so uh, we'll break up for five minutes and then we'll, we'll be back. Thank you. We're having Rishi, the uh, digital media guru. So, Facebook, Twitter, no, no, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. So, uh, how startups can leverage on the social media, how they can bring the products into a public consultancy before they launch it, maybe. How they can start a, a powerful teaser campaign. So everyone is eager to test their products. And many more. So entrepreneurs, everyone who's interested in social media, Join us at the Innovation Theatre, counting down. Wow. Uh, 
So, um, quick, uh, quick guide right at the very start, which is perhaps obvious to some, but sometimes it's worth just recapping a little bit, which is why, um, as a startup entrepreneur, or as a business, are you going to be using digital media, digital communications, and social? So what is the business case for it? Um, so there's a few areas that I'm just going to run through very, very quickly. So brand awareness is obviously very, very important. Most of you as startups, entrepreneurs, probably won't have big advertising budgets. So social media gives you a relatively cheap, quick, and agile way of growing your brand, bringing some awareness um, to who you are as a company and to help people understand what your product is before you're able to spend more money on TV and radio and print advertising. So social media allows you to build your brand in a very, very quick way from day one. Uh, PR engagement is also really, really important as well. You know, lots of what my company does is dealing with the media. And, uh, you know, in days gone by, when you dealt with the media, you used to have to write a press release and email the press release to the journalist, and that was your way of getting media coverage. Now, increasingly, journalists are saying, Do you know what, my email inbox is just flooded with press releases all day long. And actually, social media gives you an ability to engage with journalists who are going to be covering maybe your industry, who are going to be covering your technology, who are going to be covering the, the particular country that you're based in as well. And so you can start building a relationship with journalists. You can start making sure that they're aware that they're, when they're going to be writing stories about, let's say you have a startup in the travel sector, you know, when they're going to be writing stories about the travel sector or about technology in the travel sector, you've already built a relationship with that journalist, probably using Twitter, probably is, is a pretty effective means in terms of PR engagement. So when they're looking for a quote, when they're looking for someone to profile, you're there, they already know about you, and it means you don't have to hire a big expensive company to do that work for you. Because as a startup, again, you're probably not gonna have the budget to hire uh, you know, a big company to go and do your media relations for you. So PR engagement's a really, really interesting area that you can do a lot of yourself. Uh, thought leadership is a really, really interesting area. So I'm sure lots of people here, who, who here watches like all, all the TED videos and TED lectures? I'm sure lots of people here will watch that. And, and what's interesting now is a lot of companies, a lot of brands, especially those who have a very strong research base in a particular industry, are trying to get across their thought leadership and intellectual credentials using social media. So there are lots of ways you can do that, whether it's something as simple as writing a blog, uh, using LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really expanding itself at the moment, so as an entrepreneur, you can use the platform to write about your business, what you're doing, and really help people, potential investors, potential clients, understand that there's a very, very strong intellectual and technological founding to your business. So using social media to build your intellectual credentials as a business is really important. And there have been some really interesting, exciting innovations by LinkedIn in this area as well. Um, influencing the debate is also really important. And, and by this I mean, um, the very often, the government, which is a really big contractor for lots of the companies who are going to be here, it has to think about, well, how do we contract services uh, in a particular industry? And there's a debate about that. Very often, government will be using online consultations. They'll be using social media to get on board ideas for how they might think about a particular policy area. You're definitely seeing, actually, ICT Qatar itself is one of, one of the leaders in the region in terms of using social media in uh, open policy making. So social media gives you the ability to have a relationship with government to get your views across and actually influence when government's trying to use social media to think about a policy area, to put your point across in a very, very simple, straightforward, easy way. So policy debate and government engagement is a really interesting area that you can that you can help develop especially if you're running a startup that's going to be working with and alongside government as well um, data analytics um, I'm sure lots of the people here I know when I was in the um, 
the, the entrepreneurship uh, conference a couple of days ago, lots of the companies were talking about analytics. We were talking about data analytics, giving data analytics to potential customers for the service you may have. And so getting data analytics about what, for example, consumers are talking about around your products and services, what consumers are talking about when it comes to your competitors, and what, what kind of words consumers are talking about as well. You know, you may be trying to advertise your company using a set of words which you think are going to be very important in terms of advertising your company, but actually, after looking at Twitter search, after looking at the new hashtag search features that Facebook has announced or the new social graph, you might actually find that consumers are using a very, very different language. You might also find that consumers have a peak activity time of maybe 6 to 8 p.m. when they talk about your particular service. So you, that means that, okay, if consumers are talking about my product and service between these hours, I'm going to make sure I'm going to use that data to target all of my communication to that particular time frame. And you know, one thing I find is that lots of companies that we work for who are American brands, UK brands, think that they can get away in this market of using purely English language when it comes to social media. And what we'll often do is do a, a report looking at how consumers are talking about that industry and saying, look, 87% of consumers, of your target consumers, are using Arabic. And what that means is that you have to use Arabic language in your social media as well. So it's about using data to make sure your communications are more effective and more efficient as well. I think the, the most important thing as a startup, as an entrepreneur, is that you don't want to be wasting time doing things that are inefficient. And so the use of data to target your communication really precisely is, is one of the most important things to make sure that you're not wasting your time. It's a very famous um, old age saying that a uh, chief marketing officer for a big company once said that I know that 50% of my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which 50% it is. And I guess the point is with data and analytics, it means that you have a lot more awareness about what works and what doesn't work as well. Um, employee collaboration. Now, this may not uh, be a big issue for, uh, for some of you where you have no employees or only a very small number of employees, but actually when you start growing and when you're trying to get employees and teams to collaborate in a very quick, agile way, there are a whole bunch of social tools, maybe not you know, Twitter and Facebook, the ones that we're most familiar with, but definitely tools that drive a workplace collaboration. You know, lots of companies which have intranets. I mean, who here works for a company that has an intranet? Have you have intranets? And very often they're pretty old and they look like something built in the 1990s. And a lot of employees don't really use their company intranets because they're so old fashioned. And actually, a lot of companies now is effectively using their own LinkedIn page, especially if it's a private LinkedIn page, to try and get feedback about what employees care about and what they're talking about because they know that employees are using their LinkedIn profiles probably more than they're using their own company intranet. So using um, social tools and also there's a whole set of new social tools, you know, crowdsourcing tools, wikis, tools that help you drive collaboration in a business. And you know, I know that some of you will, I know that I certainly do, you might have teams working on a project in four different time zones in seven different countries and actually being able to use social tools to collaborate is a really important part of building teams and Do making sure and then making sure that you're not uh, wasting time on expensive on expensive uh, I'll wait for this and that you're not wasting time on expensive uh, video conferencing solutions um, an area that we hope you won't have to use is around crisis. Um, and obviously, the first time that you might hear about a crisis, you know, whether it's an airplane crash or a natural disaster or a, a bad restaurant review, to take a very, very simple example, Dear guest, QSTV we'll wait for this to go. We'll start now at QNCC, second floor, above Hall 6. So who here on Facebook and Twitter has seen one of their friends post a bad review for a restaurant or for a product or for a hotel? So a lot of people are getting their information about products and services from their friends and sometimes when there's a big, big problem, 
um, what you get is crisis situations. Now, if your crisis is linked to your insight and your data analytics, so you can start spotting when there might be potential crises and threats to your business as and when they're happening. So you're at least you're responding in a quick and agile way. Uh, it also means it gives you an ability to deal and respond to crisis situations using the medium that people are using. You know, when people have a problem now with their customer service, they're much more likely to post their comment on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter than they are to call a premium rate hotline and spend half an hour waiting on hold. And so as a business, you've got to make sure that, especially when you may have startup problems around the technology, around customer care, you've got to make sure that you're using um, social tools to have a really great customer experience and stopping crisis situations turning into really terminal situations for your business. Um, the final couple of areas is, in, is recruitment and um, customer service, which we've just touched on as well. And again, look, trying to find staff for startups is one of the biggest problem areas that they have, which is trying to find trained engineering talent, trained marketing talent, trained and experienced um, managerial staff, especially when you're in that critical period where you're trying to grow your business, especially in a market um, like here where maybe you haven't got access to all the talent pools. So actually, having access to all the talent that lives on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter means that you can expand your universe of potential employees and it means you don't have to necessarily start ex hiring expensive recruitment agencies and headhunters. So your ability to go to potential staff members and to start telling a story about your company and making your company look like a really exciting prospect to potential staff is a great way of cutting costs and getting the right talent on board as and when you need them. So, very, very quick run through of why digital and social media is important. Um, some of these areas are gonna be more important to some of you than in others. But I think that as you're starting to think about how social media is useful to you as a business and as an entrepreneur, as a startup, these are some of the things, a checklist maybe, to start thinking about, to at least think, well, do I have a policy or a strategy in place in all of these areas? Um, we'll move through very, very quickly. I think there's a couple of interesting principles that I think it's worth focusing on as well before we open up to questions. Um, and some of this is really just about more an analysis of where the market is and why people are using social media. And one of this is around sort of consumer psychology as well. And you know, lots of people put their hands up when they said they saw friends had posted reviews and comments about restaurants or hotels or products and services that they use. And, you know, we've always trusted our friends' recommendations. You know, they always say word of mouth has always been the most powerful kind of communications you could ever get. And social media is really just almost like an accelerated form of word of mouth communications. You know, we've always been likely to trust what our friends tell us more than what we'll trust from advertising. And actually, what social media gives you the ability to do is just get many, many more word of mouth recommendations and accelerate that process. And so we'll see, this is a big study that was done from 28,000 online consumers around consumers trust in advertising. And you can see 92% the trust comes specifically from word of mouth recommendations. And that's one of the big driving forces for people using social media. It ultimately comes down to people's trust in their friends' recommendations and their friends' opinions. And so this consumer psychology has always been there. You know, people have always trusted their friends and family members, but social media has just been able to bring that together in one place. Um, another area is around storytelling and engagement. You know, I, I follow some brands um, on Facebook, especially, and some of the content they put out, it just makes you want to go to sleep. You know, it's just press releases, it's like, oh, we're doing this offer, we're doing that offer, and you think, do you know what? I've, I've liked your brand uh, on social media because I want to learn a little bit about um, who you are, what you're about, what really motivates you, what's, what's behind the story of your company. And I want to get a little bit more of a personal insight into your organization. Um, and ultimately, that comes down to storytelling. And communications and marketing is all about telling stories about who you are. And you know, when you've got startups, you know, your story is a really, really inspiring thing. So, you know, I remember, you know, when you were pitching 
a couple of days ago, talking about your story about why what motivated you to launch your startup here is a really exciting thing. You know, I want to learn about that. I want to understand what's made you want to start this company. It's a very compelling piece of content. And that's the kind of content that increasingly people want to find. They want to get content which tells a story which is rich, which is deep, which actually gets behind the press release. You know, in a very, very simple graphic, you know, very often companies are stuck in a sort of old advertising mindset of what I call and what's often referred to as interruption marketing. You know, when you know when you buy a TV spot, when you buy 30 seconds of advertising, look, I say this as someone who started their career in traditional marketing. You know, when you bought 30 seconds worth of TV advertising where you buy a quarter page in a newspaper, you're interrupting someone. So they're watching a TV show, they bought a newspaper, and you're interrupting them. With social media, people don't really have to engage with you if they don't want to. And so your ability to tell them what you want to say is constrained because they don't have to look at what you're trying to push to them. Um, so what can you do to tell them a story that's going to be interesting, exciting, inspiring, educational? And there are some great examples of that out there, of brands which are really telling a rich story about what it is they're doing, educating consumers, and actually giving them more than what's in a press release. And actually, the sweet spot in the middle is, I guess, the area you should be aiming at, which is, what is the stuff that you want to tell consumers, and what is the stuff they're interested in? If you can focus your communications on that area, then I think you've got the starting point of a really effective strategy. Um, the power of peer-to-peer -peer communications is incredibly important as well. And, you know, I started most of my career in, um, in marketing in political campaigns where obviously your willingness to vote for a particular party is often driven by who your friends and family members are voting for. And so peer-to-peer -peer recommendations when it comes to a political party or a brand are incredibly important. So what can you do to drive peer-to-peer -peer communications? And again, I hope you can all read this, you know, but what this is just a few data points that help you understand that when you put things in the hands of consumers and when they, they do the most powerful thing which is to share some content that you've given them with their friends, with their family members, that's like an endorsement that they're giving your organization. And so what can you do to drive forward an experience where consumers, people who like your products and service are sharing that with their friends and with their family members? Data and insights, you know, again, you know, one of the issues that lots of organizations face, especially when they get a little bit bigger, is that, and again, you know, I've worked in organizations where, where, where this is the case, is that your marketing data is kind of stuck in lots of different places. So very often you'll see marketing has access to particular kinds of data, so brand indices and consumer behavior data, but customer care and customer service has data on how consumers are actually responding to particular products and services. And so one of the, the challenges that you have as your business grows is making sure that you're collecting all this data in one place so that you're able to treat the consumer in one way and you're not creating false silos in your organization. Call to action, incredibly important. And again, this comes back to that point. When you've shared a piece of content on social media, what do you want the person receiving that content to do with it? You know, it's not really good enough for them just to read it. You know, you're trying to inspire an action. And the action can be really simple. It can be a like. The action can be a retweet. The action can be a share. The action can be a link to your website. The action be, can be the start of a purchasing uh, journey. But I think a really important area that you've got to focus on is, you know, when I'm sharing a piece of content, what do I want the user to do with this when I put it into their hands? Um, you know, one of the things, one of the areas and campaigns that I was really inspired by was the Barack Obama campaign. So I worked um, for Prime Minister David Cameron when he was in office and for many, many years before that. And we really looked at the Obama campaign, what the, the great innovations that his campaign was doing, especially in 2007, 2008, where they were really a startup campaign. They were... Um, they had much smaller budgets than all the other campaigns, especially at the start. And what they were really able to do was use some of these emerging technologies to give really powerful calls to actions to their supporters to make their supporters almost like staff members. 
So giving their supporters tools to do things on their behalf. And here, these are some of the things that they could do. They could make calls on behalf of that campaign. They could create groups. They could create their own events. They were giving over a whole deck of resources that were usually only available to um, paid staff members. They were putting those into the hands of their own staff members within this kind of dashboard which they created. Um, now, most organizations aren't going to do anything as complex as this, but using the principle of uh, call to action is incredibly important because I think it gives a bit of purpose to what your communications are. And finally, how do you aggregate all the information which is out there about what's happening to do with your brand, your organization? Now, there are some companies which take this to, to the next level. Uh, this is actually Dell. This is actually a, an image of their social media, of one of their social media command centers. So Dell has something like 30,000 individual mentions of their brand on all social platforms per day. So 30,000 individual instances. So a huge amount of data which is being collected, which is being generated on a daily basis. Some of it positive, some of it negative, some of it care related, product related. And so how do you capture all of those instances of people talking about your company? You've got to have a system. Now, Dell obviously has a very, very big complex system, so which is why they've got a, a lot of people and they've got a physical infrastructure. But there are lots of sort of plug and play systems which you can now use, which are either low cost or even no cost. They help you aggregate the information that you have. You know, when I was working at 10 Downing Street, putting in place a lot of the digital communications infrastructure, we had over two million people following us on Twitter. So we had tens of thousands of people who are writing, commenting about the Prime Minister, about government policy. You know, some of it pretty negative a lot of the time. You know, a little bit of positive, a lot of it in the middle somewhere. And so what you have to try and do is work out what matters, what is important, and crucially, what can you act upon as well. You know, if you have someone who is criticize a product, if you have a consumer who's bought your product and service and has complained about it, you've got to make sure that you deal with that person in real time and you have the ability and the channel to be able to deal with them in the channel that they complain to you on. So if they've made a complaint on Twitter, you've got to be there as well, responding to them, reacting in, in that environment as well. So putting a command center in place, whether it's virtual or physical, is really important. There's some great technology so that you can have something like this kind of infrastructure that Dell has, even on your phone, um, often for free. So that's a great thing, which is the cost of this kind of infrastructure has really come down very, very powerfully. Um, so my final thing sort of before, hopefully we'll open it up to some questions, is how can you start thinking about some of the content that you might want to be generating for your brand and for your organization. There's a little bit of a framework that we put in place for the company that, that, that I work for called Layered Narrative. It, it's, it's a framework that, you, that we use, but there are all sorts of different systems that different companies use. And really, this is just, really just a thought start to help you get thinking about some of the questions you might want to be asking yourself when you're creating maybe a forward calendar for a week or for a month. Because I think the best thing is, is not just to you know, when you're thinking about your own social media, you know, like most people, you're probably not putting in place a calendar for your own personal profiles. You're probably just writing what comes to you on that particular day. But of course, when you're working on behalf of a company or your own startup, it's probably best to start planning a little bit, whether it's over a three-day horizon or a seven-day horizon, or maybe even a month horizon, start thinking, well, what kinds of content do I want to start putting out? I think that's a really important thing to start thinking about. We have a little bit of a framework to start thinking about that. Um, and it gets to the heart of that storytelling um, image I put forward a little bit earlier, which is around what do you want to tell people and what do your potential consumers want to hear about? Um, so the first area is around um, inspiration. And so this is where we often start about, which is that forget about trying to just sell to people as your starting point. I often say that one kind of general rule that I'll often use with, with clients and consumers is to say, if you're able to put out 70 to 80% of information, which isn't directly related to sales, but is around your brand, which is around your company, it kind of gives you the license to have uh, maybe 20 or 30% of your communications, which is much more specifically sales-driven. 
So that 80%, 70%, when, you talk, when you're talking about things which are inspiring to you, they're inspiring to your product and hopefully inspiring to your customers, kind of gives you the license to, to sell directly on the platform. You know, there's no point just using the platform just to try and inspire people. You know, you're not just a media publication. You've got to sell at the end of the day. But you've got to start thinking about, well, what do I want to tell people that's going to inspire them and educate them a little bit? These are some of the questions that we might start on that journey, which is, what do people want to know about my product and service? What are people interested in knowing? What do they want to embrace? And crucially, what do we hope they'll do once they learn about this? So if you have a startup, for example, in the healthcare sector, we know we see a lot of startups now in, in mobile health, digital health. Well, what are people actually concerned about? Well, people are concerned about often security. They're concerned about trust. They're concerned about privacy issues when it comes to health. So a lot of the really interesting social media channels that we often see from digital healthcare providers isn't just about selling their service. It's around getting to this issue, which is what are consumers interested in knowing about, which is I want to make sure that your product and service is going to protect my information and protect my data. So telling a story around how much you care around data privacy and data protection is one of those things that's going to help consumers think, do you know what? This company is actually going to keep my data safe and secure. So that's one really interesting stream of potential content you could be innovating with. The next area is you've got to start creating that content and information. Now this is often challenging to people, especially when they're maybe not coming from a traditional heritage of, you know, being professional writers or professional content creators. But you know, this is sometimes where people will hire friends or hire staff. But I often say, to, especially to startup entrepreneurs, that you are your best salesperson, you are your best companies advocate and marketer. So how can you create content which is going to be really, really compelling? So you got to start thinking about what kind of format do I start putting this content out in? You know, you may not have the patience to write 200 words in a, in a blog post which is going to go up on your company website. You might be someone who's more interested in using, say, a 15 second Instagram video because it's just more convenient to you. It's more, it's more likely that you're actually going to commit to that. It may be that if you start asking yourself a question around, you know, would an infographic or the, you know, would an infographic or blog post use? You know, so asking yourself a question about what kind of content are you going to create is a really important next step. And finally, you've got to start thinking about how am I going to distribute this content as well? So how do I get this content out there? And again, you know, there are your owned channels, which is that you may have your own Twitter handle, your own Facebook page, your own LinkedIn page, but there are obviously earned channels. So bloggers, journalists, uh, media publications. You know, if I was um, if I was running a startup, sorry, let, if I was running a startup. If I was a startup entrepreneur here, knowing that there are any number of journalists, media publications, newspapers, bloggers here, I'd be using social media to find out which journalists are here right now in this room, and how can I make sure that I'm meeting those people, start building that, that relationship with those people, so as and when that journalist is going to be writing a story which might have an impact on my business, or where my business might have a, have a story to tell to that article the journalist writing. They're actually thinking about me, they're thinking about my product and service. So the earned space is really important. There's also the paid area as well, which is that there are obviously paid mechanisms within social media. There are obviously ad units within, within different social media platforms that you can use. You know, you can pay to promote individual posts. You could be using uh, Twitter ads, often at very, very low cost. If you're employing staff, you can use some of the really interesting targeting mechanisms that LinkedIn's put in place. So sometimes you might want to supplement some of your organic activity with some low cost paid experimentation as well. So I think something akin to this framework we often find is useful just to start thinking about a social media program which is going to meet your business objectives. So start thinking about what's going to inspire consumers, how are you going to create the content, and how are you going to get that content out to people as well. So I'm going to close it down there. Um, really thank you all for listening as well. Um, and if there are any questions, would love to take them as well. But thank you very much for listening. 
Um, thank you first. Uh, I'd like to ask about, um, you mentioned that um, the word of mouth forms a huge influence on marketing and everything. How can you control word of mouth or measure it? Sure, so the question, in case um, anyone didn't hear it, is how can you control word of mouth because it's obviously such an important channel. And I guess the simple truth is you can't really control word of mouth because, you know, people are going to say what they're going to say. If they've had a bad experience at your restaurant, if they've had a bad experience, you can't control what they say. The only thing that you can do is make sure that you're listening actively and in real time so that when people do say things, you're you're using every available channel to make sure that you know when people are saying things and also to make sure that if someone's talking about your products and service or if someone's um, spoken something about their experience of your products and service that you're actually going to respond to them as well so they're not just putting their comment into a kind of black hole of social media but I think and again that question which you said is such a, an important question and especially with marketing people who are coming from maybe um, a more traditional media mindset where, you know, when you're buying 30 seconds of TV advertising, when you're buying a half page in a newspaper, you control what goes on that. You know, you create the 30 second video, you give it to the TV company, they run it. You know, there's nothing they can do about that. But social is, of course, very, very different. You can't control. All you can do is, is help drive understanding and also help respond to people um, if and when they've said something that maybe is wrong or factually incorrect, or you want to make sure that you have your own right of reply. Um, I think one really interesting area that I've seen this, it's some people dispute whether it's, it's pure social media or not, but TripAdvisor, you know, who here uses TripAdvisor? Um, hotels, you know, when they're, when they're thinking about booking a hotel, I know I definitely use it. Um, and a lot of hotel people, hotel managers are using TripAdvisor, to make sure that when people put their comments on, they're responding. Um, and sometimes, you know, I remember when TripAdvisor first started, uh, friends of mine in the hotel industry had, one, they were incredibly scared about it. And many people in the hotel industry are still very scared about TripAdvisor. The power of the negative review is very, very powerful. Um, but, you know, and I remember at the start, all you'd ever see are these very anodyne, vanilla responses from hotel managers saying, thank you, we've heard your comment goodbye, even if it's the most scathing, critical thing the person said. But actually now you definitely see hotel managers being a bit more um, individual in their response, sometimes pushing back to individual posters and commenters if they disagree, largely because they've seen that a lot of people are using platforms sometimes to try and get freebies and sometimes get a free meal or a free hotel stay. So actually you're seeing hotel managers and marketing people actually using word of mouth and making sure that they're actually putting forward their, their actual point of view in a much smarter, more individual way. Uh, but I guess the, 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 the long and short of it is that you can't control what people say really. That's, that's, that's not really within your power. Thank you. Okay. Rishi, thank you so much. Thank you. A big, big hand for Rishi. Actually, we should stay with us, I mean, till the end of the day, so, I mean, if you have any, any thoughts you want to share, any questions, you'll be there for us. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. So, uh, we're starting the coaching session. So, uh, we'll be showing now a table with the uh, entrepreneurs, the projects, and the name of the... Attention, please. The final presentation of the Appathon starts at 4 p.m. Yeah, we start now. So uh, we gonna. So this is the uh, coaching session starting from. I mean, we're starting a bit. Yeah, no. I mean, almost time. So uh, for each project, there is an assigned coach. So please, uh, if you need to uh, sit with your coach, do some rehearsals, uh, enhance your pitch, enhance your presentation because you need to submit your final. Final presentation of the Amazon will start at four p.m. So you need to hand your final presentation to Ahmad Shahata on the AV corner by uh, 4.45.